You're listening to the Redemption Church Podcast with Pastor Daniel Williams as we go through a series called God Redeems, a study through the book of Exodus. Oh man, so good to be with you, Redemption. How's everybody doing, man? Lord, it, time is flying. I can't believe we just celebrated, proclaim, just celebrated four-year anniversary a couple of weeks ago. Can you believe that? Come on, man. You know, we, 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 we launched uh, September of 2019, six months before the pandemic. Who would have thunk it, right? Um, and, uh, you know, you guys have such a special place. Pastor Daniel and Laura have such a special place in our hearts. Um, my wife and, and I always talk about the blessing that this church and, and this couple has been in our lives, man, and really just sowing into us and supporting us, amen, and, and just being there to, to talk and to, and to, and to just be friends, because now we're really good friends, man. They're, they're our favorite people we like to hang out with, so... Um, I'm so happy to be with you guys here tonight. Um, we're going to be in chapter 33, um, and uh, I guess the way we can go ahead and do this is we'll open up with prayer, and uh, we'll read a portion, because it's a long chapter, 27, I think it's 27 verses, right? Something like that, 20, 27 verses. Um, we'll read, go into some points, read, go into some points, um, but let's definitely go before the Lord's face and ask him to speak to us this evening, amen, that I would decrease, that he would increase, and that he would speak, amen. Lord, we come before you and we thank you for family and relationships, Lord, that will transcend our humanity, our living here on this earth, Lord, that we have relationships that will go ahead and go on for eternity, and I thank you that Kristen and I and Proclaim and Redemption have such a relationship, Lord, and it's such a special time to be able to come and share the pulpit here. Father, I pray that as we go through Exodus 33 tonight, Lord, as we uh, learn from um, Israel's mistakes, Lord, and how Moses truly uh, uh, intercedes and steps into the gap for them, Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts God, we, we know we've been busy. We know that we're carrying baggage. Maybe problems happened on the way here. Arguments, Lord, um, disruptions. Um, the enemy, God, trying to find a way to, to distract and, and destroy the move of God that you are wanting to accomplish. God, I pray that we can quiet that down and we can quiet our hearts and our minds and that we can give you our total attention. Speak to us, Holy Spirit. We're listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Exodus 33. So before I go into reading it, you know, as I was studying this week and as I was thinking like, man, Exodus 33, man, I got to give it to you, Daniel, man. 70 weeks. Is it 70 weeks you've been in this, man? Ish. Ish. All right. So I said, you know, I, I need to get through this chapter, you know, uh, the whole chapter to save him from extra, extra weeks. No, I'm joking. Um, but, but the reality is, is I got into this, and as I was reading it, a song popped into my head. Mm-hmm. You know, the title of today's message is Please Don't Go. And if you are an 80s baby like me, okay, you know what song comes to mind now. I, Casey and the Sunshine Band came right to my head, right? I got the words here, babe, I love you so, I want you to know, right, that I'm going to miss your love the minute you walk out that door, please don't go, come on, don't go, don't go away, please don't go, right, don't go, I'm begging you to stay, right, that song popped into my head, man. Why? Well, we see, man, Israel here. Man, last chapter was rough. The whole golden calf thing, man. Like, really? You just walked through the, the Red Sea, man. You saw God's miraculous wonder. You see the fire on top of Mount Horeb. Moses goes up 40 days, and, and you start to build a calf? I mean, really? And what happens? Moses comes down. 
He chastises Aaron, right? Pastor Daniel led us last week through that, or a couple weeks ago, right? As I know um, Jason preached last week. But the reality here is, as Moses is talking to the people, and as we'll go into, they recognize that there's a consequence to their actions. There's a consequence to their actions. And, and one of those consequences was that God was like, yo, I'm done. Deuces, right? Like, like I'm still going to be with you, but, but you know what? I'm going to be afar. You, you guys are going to be over there, and I'm going to be over here. And Because if I, if I actually hang out with you guys, if I actually you know, am in your midst, you're going to be consumed because of your sinfulness, because of your rebellious hearts. And what happens? Well, they were saddened. And they sang this song and to themselves. Please don't go, right? Don't go, Lord. Don't go away. And sometimes that's, that's us. We, we go ahead and we walk our own way. Even, even though we know the Lord, we, we go our own way. We go astray and we choose to do what we want to do. We pick up our own wills and say, you know what, God? I got this. And we build our own golden calves, right? We build our own idols. And we bow down to them. And then we wonder, God, where, where are you? Why can't I hear you? Please don't go. And we cry out, please don't go, Lord. I'm here to encourage you tonight as we see as Moses intercedes for them, right? God is gracious and he loves us. Amen. And, and, and he doesn't. He doesn't go, right? So let's, let's read together. Um, Exodus 33, we'll start off in verse 1 and we'll, we'll pause at verse 6. And it says here, Then the Lord said to Moses, Leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt. Now, it's very interesting. Um, he says, the people that you brought up, God and Moses have been playing this ping pong game with one another about whose people these actually are, right? You know, Moses keeps on telling them, these are your people, God. And, and God keeps on telling them, that these are your people, Moses. <laughs> why don't no one, no one wants me, man? What's going on with that? Why does, why does anyone you understand um, they, they, they they're playing back and forth and we see this they this going back and forth leave this place the people you brought up out of Egypt and go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham Isaac and Jacob saying I will give it to your descendants I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites the Amorites the Hittites the Perizzites the Hivites and the Jebusites man that was good I didn't mess up once. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn and no one put on any ornaments for the Lord had said to Moses, tell the Israelites you are a stiff-necked People, if I were to go with you, even for a moment, I might destroy you. Now take your ornaments off and I will decide what to do with you. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Oreb. Man, um, the first point and the, 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 the first um, uh, idea that I want to press to you is, is the longing for God's presence. When we step out, when we go ahead and fall out of our rhythms with the Lord, when we go ahead and, and whether we sin intentionally or whether we sin uh, unintentionally, right? Those sins of omission and those sins of commission, right? The ones that we, that we don't know about, but then there's the ones that we do know, the premeditated ones, right? You know what I'm talking about, the ones that we do anyway, even though we know God is looking, right? Right. Um, we, we, we draw far away from his presence. And, and, and at the end of the day, once you've tasted and seen how good the Lord is, 
and, and you fall in the way. See, the Israelites got to go ahead and see a taste of it. They got to go ahead and experience it, right? They got to go ahead and see the mighty hand of God work on their behalf in Egypt and to save them from the armies that were chasing against, uh, against them, right? They saw the sea parted, right? I mean, you, these miracles, they got to go ahead and experience what it was like to be in God's presence, to be, to be there with the Lord. And there's this longing, there's this longing in this, this longing of the soul, right, that, that we all have. Even before we come to the Lord, even before we place our faith in Jesus for the salvation of our souls, for the forgiveness of our sins, there is this longing inside of us. We're desiring eternity, what it says in the word that he's put, he set eternity into the heart of man that, that we would be longing and we try to fill it. We try to fill it with everything else out there, but nothing satisfies. And we sing like the psalmist here, the sons of Korah, Psalm 42, 1, as the deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you. There are those in the world that don't even understand the longings and desires that they have, but they're desiring for the Lord to meet and to satisfy the needs that they have. We, in our walk with the Lord, as we're being sanctified, as we're walking in and stepping in things that we don't, we do the same. As we step away, sometimes we feel that God is far away, but let me tell you, it's not God who's moved. God has been in the same place. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has not moved. The ones who are moving, it's us, right? It's a dear longs for the flowing stream, so my soul longs for you. David writes in Psalm 63, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. See, Israel understood what it was like to be in Egypt. They understood what it was like to be separated from God, to not hear his voice, to, to be far off, to not have a rescuer, to not have a redeemer. They, they knew. So, so when Moses came back here and, and told them, yo, check it out, dudes. I don't know, man. You guys are a stiff-necked people. You're rebellious. You want to do whatever you want to do. Oy vey, right? I mean, come on. Like, like you, you, you understand what I'm talking about here? Just like, just like us, right? Let me tell you, the, the Hebrews don't got any, any, any right to, 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 stiff, to hard stiff neck, neckness, right? We all do. But the reality here is he's telling them, hey, because of your actions, because of how rebellious you are, because of how sinful you are, God said he, he ain't going to be with you anymore. And they were singing like Casey and the said, like, I, I don't know about, I researched the song a little bit. Like, like you, you, you read the words and, and I'm trying to find out why, you, why is she leaving you, Casey? Why, why is she leaving you? Why, why are you begging her to say, what did you do? Right? What did you do? Don't go. I'm begging you to stay, please. But, okay, why are you begging, man? What, what did you actually do? Well, the Israelites knew what they did. And they knew what they did separated them. And they got to experience God's presence for a little bit. And they said, man, please, Lord, don't. Don't take your presence away from me. Take not your Holy Spirit from me, right? Three points about the longing of God's presence. Number one, the consequences of our sin. Sin separates us from God. Sin separates us from God. It's the reason why Jesus came to go ahead and rescue and redeem us to make a way so that we can be close to God again. And you're probably sitting there saying, ah, sin doesn't really separate me from God. I, I know Jesus, right? Where sin abounds, grace abounds even more, Pastor Will, right? And, and I would say, ding, 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 you're right, it does. 
But it doesn't mean that in the process you're not quenching or grieving the Holy Spirit, right? There are consequences to your actions. There, there are consequences. And, and, and listen, I know, I'm, I know I'm at home here, you know, but I, I would preach this at my own church because no one talks about sin anymore. So everything's mistakes now, right? I made a mistake, right? No, we sin. We miss the mark, right? Whether intentionally or unintentionally. And there are consequences, whether, they're, whether those consequences are spiritual, right? We know the ultimate consequence of sin is death, right? For the wages of sin, the consequences of sin is death, separation from God. If you don't get the opportunity to place your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness, that's death, it's separation, eternal death. That's some serious, serious business. But even when we know Jesus, the quenching of the Spirit, even though his grace, right, covers our sins, it doesn't mean that there aren't consequences that are, that are going to be evident in our soul and in our thinking and how we look and how we move forward with the Lord. This is why we got to keep a clean slate. When we sin, we go ahead and ask for forgiveness. We come before the Lord. We confess our sins to one another so that we can be healed. You know, a lot of people think about that healing being a physical healing, but I believe the healing that, 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 that I believe it's James, right? No. Yes, it's James. Thank you. Um, that James is talking about there. It's not, it, it's not necessarily a physical healing. It's, it's a spiritual healing because sin infects us. It changes the way we think. This is why we have to renew our minds constantly, right? As Paul talks about in Corinthians, right? We need to renew our minds. And these consequences can be evident in our lives. You know what? You're a believer and you want to mess around with pornography? Let me tell you, and you're married? Oh, it don't hurt me. It don't hurt my wife. Oh, you, you better believe it? You, 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 you don't believe that? You think you're okay with that? You're keeping that a secret? You're going, you're, you're going yourself on the computer late, on, uh, late, late at night? And, and you're going to sites that you shouldn't be going to? And you're wondering why you get into arguments with your wife and why you're separated from her and why you're far away and why there's a distance growing there. There are consequences to our sins. Those consequences are evident in our life. The necess- the, the point number two, the necessity of repentance. Like Moses, we must seek God with repentant hearts. Now, Moses came and repented on behalf of the people. Even when God, in the last chapter, right, tested Moses, was like, Moses, I'm going to do away with these people. That's it. We're going to destroy them, and I'm going to start over with you, Moses. You're my guy. God was like, let's see. Let's see how Moses reacts here, right? How is he going to, is he going to, is he going to allow his pride to go ahead and step in and say, yes, do it, Lord. Forget Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm Moses, the one drawn out from the water. But no, he didn't. He repented for not only himself, but for those people. He repented for their sin. He said, God, don't don't do that to them. Right? We need to repent. Acts 3.19 says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. The necessity of repentance. If we sin, we have to repent. We have to confess our sins. Without repentance, there can be no forgiveness, right? If we don't go ahead and truly confess and, and, and are broken and, 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 and have a contrite heart, because our sin A great price was paid. A great price was paid on your behalf and on my behalf. Jesus laid his life down because of our sins. We need to seek God with with repentant hearts, acknowledging our need for his presence. See, when we don't repent... It's like we do, we, do like, we do like what Adam and Eve did in the garden. What did Adam and Eve do in the garden? Oh, they, they ate from the tree they, they weren't supposed to eat from, right? 
They realized they were naked. They tried to cover themselves, right? The same way we try to cover ourselves, right? Hide our sin. And then you would think they're hiding from God. They're in the bushes trying to hide from God. The all-knowing, the all-seeing, the all-powerful one. And what's gracious about God is he even goes along with their game. As he walks in the garden, he says, where are you, Adam? Like he didn't really know. Where are you? And he was wanting to walk them through that confession and that repentance so that that way they would not be far away, but they would be drawn near once again. And as we sin and we understand that we need to repent, it brings us back, right? This is why it says, blessed are those, but blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. In Matthew, right, the Beatitudes, we mourn because we see our sin, but we're comforted by the fact that Jesus paid it all, amen? He paid it all. Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. That's all I know. I don't know the rest of the words. But, um, and then the key here is the danger of complacency. Moses refused to settle for a life without God's presence. He refused, and we too should resist the temptation to become complacent in our faith and in our walk with the Lord. We can become so calloused because of the things of this world, because of what happened to us, because of what she did to me or what he did to me or how my family rejected me or whatever your story is, fill in the blank. Because we all got one. If we allow that to go ahead and make us callous and to push us far away from the Lord, then who are we hurting? We're not hurting God. We're hurting ourselves. We can't become complacent in our faith. We can't just say, oh, you know what? It is what it is. It is what it is, right? We can't can't go ahead and be complacent with it. We have to dig in deeper. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Love the Lord. Seek him with all your heart. Don't grow complacent. Resist the temptation to go ahead and, and just be like, uh, whatever. Uh, it's, you know, I've seen this all before. And let me tell you, for those who have been walking with the Lord, this is a, this is a temptation, man. We've walked with the Lord for years. And you know what? We've seen people come in, they go, they get saved, they're on fire, and then they cool that, right? You know? You go through seasons of, oh, yeah, I'm on fire, and then uh, it wanes. You can grow complacent in your walk with the Lord. And let me tell you, sometimes, sometimes I will tell those who are in that place, please do me a favor. Don't hang out with the new Christians. Don't hang out with the people who just got saved because I don't want you to go ahead and rain on their parade, please, okay? Don't allow your negative uh, Nancy-ism, right, to go ahead and and affect those who went ahead and and are on fire for the Lord, right? This This is what John, as Jesus was talking to the church of Ephesus, said, right? Hey, listen, you've forgotten your first love. Go back to do the things that you did in the beginning. Why? Because in the beginning, you were in love, man. In the beginning, man, my wife, when I first met her and we were dating, I would drive a half an hour to go ahead and get, what was it, honey? It was Larry's, right? Larry's. It was some good uh, frozen yogurt, right? It was frozen yogurt. And and let me say, I would wait for the call. It would be like 8.30 at night. I'd be like, all right, she going to call? And she would call. She's like, hey, what's up? Oh, what's up, babe? You want some Larry's? Oh, Yeah. Ask mom, ask dad, right? You know, I used to call him mom and dad. We weren't even married yet. But I would drive 
and get the Larrys 20 minutes from my house and then drive 40 minutes to their house, all the way down to Cooper City. I used to live in Tamarack. But I would go ahead and do it because, I, man, I was like, yo, come on. Wouldn't you? Or didn't you? Didn't you when you first? Man, it was fresh. Don't grow complacent, amen? Don't grow complacent in your relationship with the Lord. Man, God is so amazing that, 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 that we could go ahead and go on for eternity about all of his, all of his multifaceted, multidimensional. Mo- I mean, you know, you guys, you guys are watching Marvel now, man. I mean, you know, they, 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 they're talking about different dimensions. God transcends all of that, man. He, he, you can go ahead and think about him. And it's like, man, you can think about him forever, forever, and you can never get bored. You can never get bored. Don't grow complacent, Amen. Let's move on. 7 through 11. Let's read together. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Um, The tent of meeting. This is not the tabernacle of meeting, okay? This is the tent of meeting. The tabernacle has not been set up. You'll be hitting there in a couple of of weeks as as the chapters come. But this is the tent of meeting, right? Um, And the tent of meeting, anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. They didn't put it inside the camp. Again, they put it outside the camp, right? They didn't put it inside. God didn't want to be in their midst. He wanted to be outside, right? But it also showed and gave the the, the Israelites an opportunity to go to him, right? It was almost a sacrifice. They had to get out of their camp to go to him. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrance of their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. And as Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. And whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they all stood and worshiped each at the entrance of their own tents. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young age, Joshua of Nun, did not leave the tent, the tent of meeting. Tabernacle. You'll, you'll get into this a little, a little bit more in depth in a few, in a few chapters, but, but the word tabernacle could be used as the tent of meeting. But this tabernacle, this place of dwelling where Moses was meeting with God, was special. Now it says here that they met face to face, but but what, what what the writers here are inferring is not that Moses got to see the face of God because no one can go ahead and see the face of God and still live. It was as if they were talking, right? The, Mo, God was speaking to Moses as if it was face to face. Because you'll read later on in this chapter that God that Moses asked God to go ahead and show him his face, to go ahead and show him his glory, but but God couldn't do that because Moses would die, right? But we have here this this tabernacle, this place of dwelling where this pillar would come down a cloud. Now, can you imagine seeing that right now? Can you imagine if I was, you know, forget about me. Imagine Daniel was preaching up here. And next thing you know, you saw a cloud just come down and and God's prayer. Man, holy cow. Huh? Yeah, I, I, I mean... Not holy cow, right? (laughs) But I mean, think about it, man. They got to go ahead and see this. And they worship God from the front of their tents as they saw this happen. They worship God. And and it really points us to sort of the New Testament, right? The tent of meeting, this this place of dwelling. And um, this is uh, John chapter 4. The whole scene with the Samaritan woman, with Jesus, right? Jesus meets the Samaritan woman, right? Um, he goes out of his way to go into Samaria, right? He could have went a different way that would have been shorter, but he went all the way out of his way to go to Samaria, to go to the place where the Jews weren't supposed to go because he had an appointment with this lady, a divine appointment, where he would reveal himself for the first time to be the Messiah, 
to be the chosen one, to be our savior. And he would let the cat out the bag. And as they're having this conversation, and you may know it, and I want it for time, I'll keep it short, but woman, he goes to her. Jesus replied, believe me, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Now, the whole argument between the, Samar- the, the Samarians um, and, and the Jews was the place of worship. They believed that they, would, that they should worship on the mountain, and the Jews said, no, you got to worship in the temple. And obviously, the Jews were right because that's what God erected. But still, they were fighting over this. And Jesus is like, yeah, yo, hold up one second. Let me tell you, I'm, I'm going to let you in on a little secret here, okay? I'm going to let you in on this, on, on, on this new thing that I'm doing, because I'm doing a new thing here, right? Because I'm bringing a new agreement, a new covenant, right? It doesn't matter where you're going to worship, because look, it doesn't, it's not going to matter whether you worship here on this mountain or whether you worship in the temple in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and it's now. It is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. He was alluding to the fact that when he died and he said, it is finished, The Bible tells us that within the temple, that the curtain that divided the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple was torn from top to bottom because God's spirit could not be held back anymore. His love just wanted to go ahead and pour out because he was looking for human tabernacles to go ahead and live inside of. He was looking for tents of dwelling, not within buildings made with man's hands, but he was looking to be inside of you, inside of me, as now his presence would dwell inside of each and every one of us how dope is that man yo dope right for real no ye not no ye not you're the temple no ye not no ye not you're the temple no ye not no ye not you're the temple you are the temple of the holy ghost Filled with power, filled with grace, filled with glory. You don't know that? Okay, you don't know it. That's okay. But nonetheless, we, we, are, we are these places of tabernacle now where the, where the Holy Spirit dwells. We are the temples of the Holy Spirit. Now God is not dwelling in, 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 in temples made by hands. He's made of temples of flesh. He's living inside of each and every one of us now. And this sort of preludes, sort of what, what that is going to look like as Moses goes into this tent and, and God's presence falls down, the people get to go ahead and see from afar. Man, and, and as they see, and it's cool, man, they see this cloud fall down, they're like, man, I, I wish, that, that would be awesome to go ahead and talk to God and to have that type of relationship, man. Wouldn't that be amazing? Come on. It is amazing, isn't it? It is. The significance of the tent meeting. Just as Moses had a designated place to encounter God, this is the practical for you. We should also create sacred spaces in our lives for intimate communion with the Lord. You need to go ahead and create intimate spaces You know, that part in the Bible where it talks about go into your closet? Yeah, go into your closet. I mean, we live in Florida. I think every single house has at least one, what do you call that? Walk-in closet, right? (laughs) Not me. See, I get the little closet. My wife uses the walk-in closet and the other closet, right? No, no, now, 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 now our bedroom has big enough closets. When we first got our first condo, right, my closet was in the other room, right? I wanted to give that to her, right? She didn't, she didn't, she didn't, she didn't kick me out of the closet. Um, but the whole idea of the closet, 
going somewhere intimately with the Lord, where you can go before the Lord, and it's not based on who's watching you or who can go ahead and see you, or you know whether you're going to get uh, accolades and pats on the back from other people. But that you will spend that intimate time with the Lord. The people would look on. And it wasn't going to be for another 15, almost 1,600 years after this that the people were going to actually be able to have that intimacy with the Lord. And now that we have it, what do we do with it? Accessibility of God. I think we see here as, as God is still meeting with Moses, he hasn't thrown out the baby with the bathwater, right? He hasn't given up on Israel. Even though they are stiff-necked, even though they are rebellious, God was still going to hold on to his promises that he made to Abraham, to Jacob, and to Isaac, that their descendants would go ahead and be blessed. And God still gave Moses accessibility. The fact that God spoke to Moses face-to-face, right, highlights the accessibility that we have to God through prayer and his word. We have that accessibility today. We are able to go ahead and interact with the God of the universe at any time, at any place, anywhere. We are able to go ahead and commune with the holy God. You're at your job, day's going rough. You can go into your bathroom, close the store and sit down and say, God, I need you right now. And he's there because he's with you. He's in you. Accessibility. That's what we have now. Unlimited accessibility. We have his word. You know, I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I believe God speaks through his people, and I believe that God speaks prophetically. But I believe that that the most important prophetic word he's given us is the actual word of God. I have some Baptist friends who don't believe. They say, you you, you want to hear God speak to you? Read your Bible. You want to hear God speak to you aloud? Read your Bible aloud. (laughs) <laughs> is what they would go ahead and say. That's not me, but I want to point the picture here that God's word is for us. It's for you. It's that love letter that he's given us so that we can know what is acceptable, what his perfect will is for our lives, right? What does it say in the word? Hey, the word is like that double-edged sword, right? That's able to divide bone from marrow. That's able to divide our souls from our spirits, so that we can know what is, what is God's perfect and acceptable will. And lastly, the transformative power, not lastly, but lastly for this, for, for, for this section, transformative power of God's presence, spending time in God's presence transforms us. Think about that. You hear here as Moses meets with God, and you'll hear that, 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 that when he met and was in the presence of God, that he would have this this glow about him, right? He would have this shine on, right? He would be like, bing, you know, it it, it would be amazing. People would be able to see him. And and it was so bright that people would look that he would even cover his face, right? He had this, this, this glow because he was in the presence of God. Man, when you spend time with God, intimately and, 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 and alone and, and, and you're sharing your heart and, 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 and you're talking with God, it transforms you, man. You are different. You are different. You see things from a different perspective. You start to go ahead and notice the enemy and the spiritual warfare that's going on around you. You're like, I, I, I see that devil, all right. Yes, I got to spend more time with God so I can see more. You see all that stuff, and, 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 and you're able to walk, not by the flesh, but by the Spirit. Man, and people will see that evidently in your life. People will see you and know that you have spent time with God because of how you live and how you walk. 
Now, if that's true, the opposite is true too, right? The opposite is, you know, my wife knows when I need to spend time with the Lord. If I'm getting short, angry, hangry, right, whatever, you know, she knows, yo, yo, why are you, why, why are you getting on me today? Oh, I'm sorry, honey. I need to go ahead and, and pray. I need to go ahead and spend some time with God so I can get my head on straight, right? There's power in the presence of God when we intimately go to him and we're spending time with him. We're being filled with the Holy Spirit so that we can pour that spirit out, right? Like that, like that conduit, a river of flowing water as he talked about. Let's read the final section, verses 12 through 23. It wasn't 27. I was wrong. Verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, oh, one point before we go there. One point that I don't want to miss. In In the last verses, it said that God spoke with Moses like a friend. Hmm. God is near you. Jesus said to his disciples in chapter 15 that you're not my servants. You, you, I call you my friends now. If you do what I command, and that command was to love one another. But God, God has called us his friends. For what Jesus has done for us, we have that intimate relationship with God. God is your friend. I know sometimes you think about, oh, God is so big, he's so holy, he's so, he's so accessible. He's close. He's not far off. He loves you. He's your friend. Let's read verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me. Now, I looked over to the clock, bro, it's not on, so I just wanted to let you know. Okay. The time is not on, so you know. I got all the time in the world, right? <laughs> you have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your way so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. Moses is basically telling God, no ticky, no laundry, okay? If you ain't going to be there, I ain't going to go. We are not going without your presence because I'm not going to go one way or this way or that way if you're not going that way, this way or that way. Moses understood. He wanted to be led by God. He wanted God to be in his midst in the midst of the people guiding them and directing them because Moses loved God. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. Come on, Lord. Show me your glory. I mean, you figured, right? Man, I asked for a couple things and you gave me the answer. I'm going to go ahead and go for one more. I'm going to ask. I'm going to to, uh, show me your glory, Lord. Come on. Yes. He's saying yes. You know, in sales, they tell you that if if you get one yes, keep on asking. Because once someone says yes the first time, they're, they're more likely to go ahead and say yes over and over again, right? And he says, show me your glory. What a bold request. 
some boldness there. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live again. Moses was not seeing God's face before, but he was, he was speaking to Moses as if face to face, right? Because Moses would have died if he would have seen God's face, face to face. And it says, then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. And I don't know if that's, if that's a picture of Jesus if I've ever seen one before, right? Mm -hmm. Man, standing on the rock, the solid rock, to be able to engage and interact with the holy God of the universe. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. The bold request, Moses, hear is making this bold request as he is interceding and, to, and asking God, saying, God, don't, don't make us go to the left or to the right if your presence is not going to go with us. Wherever you go, we want to go. Don't send us, God, please. And God answers his prayer and says, don't worry, Moses. All right, we're good. I'm going to go because you, I have, you have favor in my sight and I know your name. I'm going with you. We're going to keep on doing this, that, you know, Let's do this. And Moses goes, man, he said yes to that. I'm going to ask for one more. Show me your glory, oh God. Oh, that we would have the boldness and desire not just to go ahead and seek the hand of God, but to seek his heart, right? Not just to seek the answer of the prayer, but to seek his glory, to seek his heart, his actions. That we would have this boldness to desire to go ahead and bask in his glory. Hebrews 4.14 says, They're seen then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Man, Peter talks about the royal priestlyhood here, right? How we now, we now have access, we now have, 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 have God is available to us, that we don't have to go to a go-between any longer, that we can go directly to God ourselves, right? We don't need someone to go on our behalf for us like they did in the temple. The priest would have to go in. He was wearing bells, right? And he would go into the Holy of Holies, right, and, 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 and do the sacrifice that one time of the year. And if they stopped hearing the jingle bells, that you, right, he was done. He was gone. He was dead. They had, they had to bring out the Apollo hook. You guys ever watch Apollo? The showtime at the Apollo? It's showtime, right? They, they would bring out that hook. They would bring that hook out for the priest to go ahead and get him out because they couldn't go in. The Holy of Holies. But now... We've been made holy. Oh, come on, man. We have been made holy through what Jesus did for us on the cross. And we can go ahead and enter into the Holy of Holies. We can go in and we have access. And we can go in boldly. Moses was, was, was just like, yo, man, I know this is coming, so I'm gonna just going just to go ahead and do this now, man. You know, hey, God... Let me see your glory, man. I want to know you. I want to, and this is, this is Moses' desire. He wanted to know the God of the universe personally, intimately. He wanted to see his face. He wanted, man, he was longing the same way we are all longing for that relationship with God. We all long to be known intimately. I know we all try to hide who we are and all of our warts, right? Try to cover ourselves, but we long to be 
to be intimately known by God, by someone else. And Moses wanted to know God intimately. He wanted to see his glory. And what's amazing is that desire that Moses had is something that we have access to today. We can know God intimately. We can enter into his presence. We can, we, we can go into the holy of holies, right? Like that beautiful song we sing, take me past the outer courts into the holy place, past the brazen altar. Oh, Lord, I want to see your face. I know it better in Spanish than in English, but anyway, because I grew up in a Pentecostal church, but, um, uh, you know, take me past, you know, take me, take me into the holy, that, that, that one, in the holy of holies, where the God's presence was. Take me in by the blood of the lamb. Moses had an audacity to, to his request, right? He boldly asked to see God's glory, demonstrating a deep hunger for a closer relationship with him. Do you, do you have that audacity? To go ahead and say, God, I'm willing to sacrifice whatever it is to have a deeper, more intimate, and closer relationship with you. I'm willing to lay whatever it is aside. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to go ahead and say that to the Lord? And we see God's gracious response to Moses. God in his mercy reveals a portion of his glory to Moses, emphasizing his willingness to reveal himself to those who earnestly seek him. Those who earnestly seek the Lord. Hebrews 6, 11, 6 says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek after him. For you note takers, that was Hebrews eleven six. 6. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek after him. He is gracious in his response to Moses. And he's been more than gracious to everyone inside of this room. His response to our need, his response to our depravity, to our sin was sending his son to die on the cross so that we could know him intimately, so that we could commune with him. Amen? Nasty. And this is lastly this time. The transformative nature of God's glory. As we seek God's glory, we too can be transformed into his image, reflecting his character in our lives. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's an oxymoron. If you're a sacrifice, you ain't living. But Jesus makes that possible, that we can be actually living and a sacrifice at the same time. This is why the angels be looking at us and be like, man, I don't know how he did it, but he did it, man. Look at these guys. They, they're full of God's glory, but they're full of flesh as well. Like, what's going on in here, Gabriel? Do you got any insight over here? No, nah, man, I don't got any insight, Michael. I don't know what you're talking about. But okay, but, but this is why they look at us. It's like this big mystery, right? The Bible says they look at us and wonder. Like, really? He did that for you? For them? Man, God's a good God. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that when, that then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will for your life. When we seek after God's glory, when we seek after him wholeheartedly as we are being renewed in our minds we can be transformed by the power of his Holy Spirit amen and we can be a true reflection of God's image to the world 
a true reflection of Jesus Christ. It's unfortunate sometimes, you know, I, I think it was the quote that Gandhi said, right? He said that he would have become a Christian. He would have became a Christian if he had never met one. I think he had said that. Correct me if I'm right or wrong, Robin. I know you're like the historian guy. It, 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 he said that. Because he, he read about the God of the Bible and he read about how Christians were supposed to be. But, but then when he met some Christians, he was like, Ugh, I don't know. I don't know about that. This is not to heap condemnation on you. This is to encourage you. Man, seek after the Lord. Seek after him boldly. Allow your life to go ahead and be transformed by what he did. And if you haven't, if you haven't gone ahead and given your life to him, man, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? He loves you. He loves you. I encourage you. I know we're going to participate in communion here in a second. But if you, if you haven't gone ahead and given your life to the Lord, don't wait any longer. Tomorrow's not promised. Tomorrow's not promised to us. If you hear, God is calling you. He's saying, come home. Come be with me. You're my son. You're my daughter. I'm not going to reject you. If I didn't reject the Israelites, I'm not going to reject you. Trust me. He's calling you. Don't deny him. Today's the day of salvation. Receive him today. Place your faith in him. Place your faith in the work of the cross for the forgiveness of your sins and for the salvation of your soul. Amen? He is gracious to you. He's provided this way for you. And most of all, he wants you to be part of his family. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for your word. I thank you, God. That through this chapter, we see your grace, Lord. We see our longing and our need of you. And we see how you always, you always make a way. You always stand in the gap. You always reach out and rescue us, oh God, the same way you continue to reach out and rescue the Israelites, Lord. You continue to be gracious toward them, oh Father. I pray that, that you would go ahead, God, as we prepare our hearts to participate in communion, oh Father. you would help us to, to see, Lord, the great sacrifice that was paid for our folly, for our sin, oh Lord, how you have made us clean. You've washed us white as snow, Lord, and we are so, so thankful, Lord. We're so thankful for you. I pray if there's anyone in here, God, that, that wants to go ahead and, 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 and make a decision to follow you, Lord. You, you have opened their eyes, as the Bible said, through your spirit, O oh God, and shown them their need of you, Lord. I pray, O oh God, that they, Lord, they don't got to raise a hand, God. They don't got to come forward, Lord, but that they would sincerely in their hearts, Lord, place their faith on the work of the cross, Lord, because it is by faith that we are saved, oh God, by nothing else. It's not a work of in, and of, our, uh, in and of ourselves, though, that anyone should boast, oh God. It's a gift of you, Lord. We are saved by faith through grace, oh God. We thank you for that, God. And as we prepare our hearts, Lord, we, we come confessing, Lord, we are sinners. We are sinners, Lord, in need 
of your forgiveness, God. Wash us clean. You're faithful and just to do just that, O Lord, to wipe our slates clean, to, to remove our sin from us as far as the east is from the west, Lord. You remember it no more, God. Thank you. Thank you for that, O God. Thank you for that, O Lord. As we have this sacred, holy moment, O Father, I pray that, Holy Spirit, you would minister to your people. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.